This week to be closer to China. 2018 marks five years of China's Belt and Road Initiative. President Xi Jinping's global vision of building infrastructure and connectivity. The Silk Road Economic Belt over land, engaging Central Asia and linking Europe with China, and the 21st century maritime Silk Road over water, reaching Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, and Africa. The Belt and Road Initiative has become the centerpiece of China's foreign policy. What are its major goals? We say the five pillars are trade, trade cooperation, trade cooperation, trade cooperation, trade cooperation. The Belt and Road Initiative calls for a more interconnected world. What is the Chinese government's role in promoting connectivity? I think that the government has played a role in this protective role. 首先一个呢，政策啊，沟通呢是要靠从中央政府的顶层设计。How does the Belt and Road Initiative deliver shared benefits to developing countries, to China, to the world? We just try to have this proposal to work out for the better of the days and life of people all around the world. That's the core value of Belt and Road. This week, be closer to China. The Belt and Road Initiative, President Xi Jinping's grand global vision that he first put forth in 2013, is short for the Silk Road Economic Belt over land, engaging Central Asia and linking Europe with China, and the 21st century maritime Silk Road over water, through which China reaches out to countries in Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Many people are energized. Some are anxious. All can benefit from understanding President Xi's strategic initiative to engage some 70 countries, most of them developing countries, providing much needed infrastructure and solidifying China's global economic integration. Let's do a five year checkup, discern what has been accomplished, what problems have been encountered, what challenges lie ahead. We focus first on how Belt and Road affects China's domestic development. Too often, Chinese officials, with all good intent, emphasize how much Belt and Road benefits developing countries, which it surely does, but they do not even mention how Belt and Road benefits China. This raises suspicions. After all, Belt and Road is business and geopolitics, not charity and foreign aid. So. Does Belt and Road benefit China? Which areas and sectors are engaged? What are the opportunities? What are the obstacles? We investigate China's Belt and Road Initiative to be closer to China. The Belt and Road Initiative, originally known as One Belt and One Road, was first put forth by China's President Xi Jinping in 2013 in Kazakhstan. We want to build the relationship 打造互利共赢的命运共同体。The initiative, which references the historical Silk Road as commercial precedent, calls for regional integration into a cohesive economic area through the building of infrastructure, increasing trade, and enhancing cultural exchanges. Now there are 71 countries engaged in Belt and Road projects, ports, roads, railways, and other forms of infrastructure. At the inaugural Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in 2017, China signed 270 agreements on just 76 items. There are many flagship projects, such as the China EU freight train and Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway. While overseas projects have always been the center of attention, China's various localities, such as Xi'an and Chuanzhou, are also building momentum to leverage the Belt and Road Initiative. Xi'an is an important link in the Belt and Road because historically it was indeed the beginning of the ancient Silk Road. Give me an overview of what has been accomplished. What are some of the successes and what are the reasons for those successes? 
The Belt and Road Initiative proposed by President Xi Jinping I think is very important for Western China, particularly for Xi'an. It brings major strategic opportunities for development. We consider the Belt and Road Initiative greatly important and hope that it will help the opening up of the city. In the past five years, our work has started with the five major goals. Policy coordination, facilities connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration and people-to-people -people bonds. I think the changes that have influenced us the most here are facilities, connectivity, people-to-people -people bonds and unimpeded trade. For example, a few years ago, we launched the Chang'an International Freight Train, which runs along the Belt and Road route. The number of trains had increased from one train per month in 2013 to 194 by last year and to 545 for just the first six months of this year. It's not just the number that has increased, it's also the value of their journeys. Initially, the trains left for Europe with more loads than would return, but 100% of the trains now return with loads. This means that the return load rate can be higher than the leaving load rate for some trains. From this perspective, the facilities connectivity brings Asia and Europe closer and promotes trade development. This offers obvious benefits for us. Quanzhou was the origin of the ancient Maritime Silk Road, and now with the 21st century Maritime Silk Road, what can the local government do to use this history and rich culture and people-to-people -people exchanges to facilitate Belt and Road projects? Quanzhou is the origin of the ancient Maritime Silk Road. Quanzhou was the start of the ancient Maritime Silk Road. During the Song and Yuan dynasties, Quanzhou witnessed the exchanges between and integration of the East and West during the prime era of China's economic and cultural foreign exchanges. It was a successful example of a cultural and trade exchange between the East and West on the ancient Maritime Silk Road. It created a maritime road for free trade, peace, friendship and prosperity. At the same time, it was a road for mutual exchanges, inclusiveness and cultural dialogue between the West and the East. Quanzhou demonstrated the essence of maritime Silk Road, peace, friendship, cooperation and common prosperity. This is a great source of inspiration today and it makes Quanzhou an important starting point for China's going out policy. From investment to trade, from the construction of infrastructures to people-to-people -people contacts. So almost everywhere, anywhere, you could hear people is talking or people being talked about Belt and Road Initiative, though still with certain doubts or criticisms. To me, they are very natural. Because that's something so new, so special, so unprecedented in the world. That's why doubts will get along with this development. You cannot just try to wave out all the doubts all of a sudden. But facts themselves will speak. For those criticisms, reminders, suggestions, proposals on the basis of goodwill, we should thank them. We should take all of those in a very serious and sincere way. However, we just cannot try to accept those criticisms without facts and just come out from ideology viewpoints of view. All in all, this is a world and we just try to have a very interesting proposal and we just try to have this proposal to work out for the better of the days and life of people all around the world. That's the core value of Belt and Road. Since its inception, Belt and Road projects have received criticism along with praise. Certainly host countries are very much appreciative and praise Belt and Road, but there are local voices that express concerns. 
And indeed, in the Western media, there is increasing concerns about the Belt and Road Vision and specific Belt and Road projects. What are some of these concerns from both host countries and from uh, Western critics? And what should China do about it? What lessons can be learned? How can things be improved in the future? Many Belt and Road countries have complicated domestic situations, such as political instability and weak infrastructure. Those are pain points. They are risks as well as opportunities. It is those pain points that offer development opportunities for Chinese enterprises and opportunities for improving systems. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is a good example. Infrastructure investment needs significant assets. Though the Asian Development Bank and World Bank were there to support it, they weren't efficient enough. Against this backdrop, the AIIB was established with our efforts to solve the infrastructure financing problem. We have those problems in reality, so the Belt and Road Initiative was proposed to solve them. Lying along the ancient Maritime Silk Road, the port of Rotterdam initiated the engagement between China and the Netherlands 400 years ago. The Netherlands is famous for its high-quality dairy products, producing about 13 billion kilograms of milk a year and accounting for more than 10% of the world's trade of dairy products. Meanwhile, dairy remains a young industry in China with a supply shortage of around 4 million tons every year. China's Belt and Road Initiative is now bringing Dutch experience to its dairy industry. The EU standards followed by Dutch dairy products, meaning the quality, the so-called grass-to-glass quality control system, the production of high-quality milk, and the training of farmers should be adopted by China. When China's president, Xi Jinping, visited the Netherlands in 2014, both sides agreed to work together in agriculture, particularly in dairy, breeding and food safety. Now, every year, about 10% of Dutch dairy products worth about 800 million euros are exported to China along the 21st century maritime Silk Road, helping to fill China's huge demand gap for dairy products. China has signed bilateral trade agreements and arrangements with 106 countries and regions. In the first quarter of 2018, the trade volume between China and Belt and Road countries registered 1.86 trillion RMB, or about $270 billion, a year-on-year -year increase of 12.9 percent. Seventy-five overseas economic and trade cooperation areas have been established, generating an aggregate of $27 billion and providing 210,000 local jobs for host countries. Exchanges between China and Belt and Road countries are becoming more frequent. With some 200,000 students from Belt and Road countries studying in China and an expected 150 million outbound Chinese tourists to Belt and Road countries in the next few years. The Belt and Road Initiative, with its vision of improved connectivity and in infrastructure, trade, finance, general policies, and people-to-people -people exchanges, is committed to pursuing a more interconnected world. The Chinese government, obviously, is playing a vital role. What can the Xi'an government do to leverage its culture and its history in terms of people-to-people -people exchanges or other activities to facilitate the development of Belt and Road Project? I think the government's role here is irreplaceable. First, policy communication is built on the central government's plan. Local government is also important. For example, our provinces or cities establish amicable relations with counterparts in the Belt and Road countries. This actually builds a foundation for people-to-people -people bonds. With this foundation and people's support, we will have more understanding and more participants for the initiative. Some people were skeptical and hesitated in the past, but now they're enthusiastic. It wouldn't happen so fast if it were not the design of the government. So the government is crucial for its design, policy communications and exchanges with foreign countries. Local governments do a lot to connect people, communicate with governments and implement national policies and strategies. At civil society level, through cross-border e-commerce, importing and so on, business exchanges have been much more frequent than before, and they have built a cooperation mechanism of trust. 
I think this is crucial and irreplaceable. The efforts from the national government, local government and civil society have contributed to today's success. What's the role of government in facilitating people-to-people -people exchanges, which is an important part of the Belt and Road Initiative? About people-to-people -people bonds, we have a saying that amicable relationships between people hold the key to sound relations between states and amicable relationship between people are built upon people-to-people -people bonds. With people-to-people -people bonds, we can achieve the other four goals of connectivity. In recent years in developing Quanzhou as a core city for the 21st century maritime Silk Road, Quanzhou has done a great deal in establishing people-to-people -people bounds with Belt and Road countries. What is the significance of connectivity for the Belt and Road and for globalization in general? This is a kind of globalized world in all aspects, politically, economically, socially, culturally, and in certain sense, legally. So globalization is a major trend and has been the major trend ever since. Frankly speaking, some people say it's right after the Second World War or even before. So, Belt and Road Initiative is a very strong touch of globalization. We make the world even much closer connected, not in a sense of geography, but in a sense of the very common understanding of the people. Just I mentioned the connectivity. Connectivity sometimes you just look at it as something physical. But more than physical connectivity is mental. Because among all the member states of the United Nations, 197, sorry, 193 at this moment, no one tried to go away from prosperity, economically speaking, of their nation. Each and every country is working hard for the prosperity of the nation. Prosperity, both materially and mentally. Materially is, just as I mentioned, the connectivity of those. That's a part of globalization. But in the same way, at the same time, how to make better understanding of people, better understanding of each other, the ways of doing things, the mentality behind the things, so on and so forth, to me is even more important. It's another aspect of globalization. So all in all, Belt and Road is a very big step of globalization itself. The benefits of Belt and Road projects to host countries are obvious. Infrastructure is essential for economic growth, the surest path out of poverty. Explaining how China also benefits builds credibility for China. In addition to diverse benefits such as access to natural resources and utilizing China's industrial overcapacity, among other benefits, several of China's provinces on the front lines of Belt and Road projects are relatively underdeveloped. As such, various localities are leveraging Belt and Road projects to boost their local economies bringing tangible benefits to local people and helping to rebalance socioeconomic imbalances across China. Thus, China's less developed regions become a kind of bridge between China's developed regions and the rest of the developing world. Mutual benefits exemplify President Xi Jinping's international principle of win-win cooperation. The slogan, shared benefits, implies that both host countries and China benefit from Belt and Road projects, yet some feel that China is more equal than the host countries and shares so-called more than the host countries do. Uh, is that uh, accusation true? I used to have on-the-spot survey of projects on Belt and Road. I don't see 
any benefits we can take these days. Frankly speaking, those people are working in the projects overseas. Most of them are youngsters. If they stay in China, I will say the living conditions could be much better than in those remote and backlash places. However, they keep up in mind a kind of doctrine seen by China by ancestors of China. That goes, when you are poor, you need to cultivate and build yourself into a good human being. But when you are rich, rich not necessarily in the sense of money, rich in their sense of the ability, meaning if you could help others, then you should take the whole world under your personal situation and consideration. So this is a very good saying. Most of Chinese youngsters nowadays are working for Belt and Road Initiative projects. They have been working so hard. I've been to Iran, to Russia, to Vietnam, to Cambodia, to Kazakhstan, and many other places. Frankly speaking to me, they are nowadays serving as half as volunteers, half of professionals to the projects. I couldn't say, and I won't accept, that China has taken most of the benefits from the project. Not at all. In order to support Belt and Road projects, what initiative has China rolled out domestically? The fifth part of the report of the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China is about economic development, and the theme is building a modern economic system. There are six priorities, and the sixth priority is the all-round opening up. The central government decided that the priority is the Belt and Road. This is a clear direction. A fundamental lesson we have learned from the past 40 years is that reform always follows opening up. We needed to correct one thing. At the beginning, we thought that the Belt and Road was to export our excessive capacity. But isn't it about cooperation? This was people's idea about the Belt and Road way in the beginning, but it was soon corrected. If we say the Belt and Road is to export excessive capacity, we may give the international community the impression that Chinese are dumping garbage in those countries. Now we don't talk about excessive capacity when it comes to the Belt and Road. Instead, we say it's capacity cooperation. We are developing industries, cooperating on capacity for mutual benefits. We are not selling excessive stuff there. On the reform and benefits, I want to talk about two aspects. First, Chinese cities. Chinese cities should open up more and attract talent that they need in the process of developing the Belt and Road. So one reason to propose the Belt and Road was to turn the end of reform and opening up into a start for the reform and opening up in the new era. One thing that is interesting is that the initiative was proposed on September 7, 2013 in Kazakhstan. As one of the five countries in Central Asia, it is a hinterland country, bordering the five provinces of northwestern China, Xinjiang, Shanxi, Gansu, Ningxia, and Qinghai. Those provinces are regarded as the end of reform and opening up. Why? They lack awareness of opening up, services, and business. So the Belt and Road Initiative is to activate the end of the reform and opening up and turn it into the start of reform and opening up in the new era. Secondly, enterprises. In the Belt and Road development, the state-owned enterprises are vanguards, and private enterprises are fresh troops. So in the past five years, to some extent, state-owned enterprises have a strong sense of gains, but we cannot succeed without private enterprises, the fresh troops. For cities, government leadership is not enough. We also need enterprises to participate. In some cities, only state-owned enterprises take part. There are not enough private enterprises participating. Judging from the direction of the Belt and Road development, we know that it won't succeed without good private companies in some places. In the 2017 Fortune 500, there were 115 Chinese enterprises, but only 20 Chinese mainland private companies. This is not enough. But in the Belt and Road development, the private companies participate will improve the international community's impression of and favorability toward China. What does the Belt and Road Initiative do to implement uh, President Xi Jinping's vision of a community with a shared future for all humanity? We just don't want to take 
that initiative is something within the boundary of the nation. We understand very well. Just because along with the development of China, we have received so many supports, sympathy, understanding, goodwill worldwide, it's time for China to do something in return. Frankly, China is doing something in return, has been doing something in return, and it will do that in the future. So, so-called the construction or build-up of the community as one destiny for the whole nation, whole world. Just because we should notice a very common phenomenon and reality. This globe is the only place for us to work, to live forever. So if we do something good for it, then people could share with the goodwill. Lai West China did it for the first time to host Summer Olympic Games 10 years ago. Like China did eight years ago for the first time hosting the World Expedition in Shanghai. And I personally contributed my 10 years of life to the project. All those events are very, very strong indication and effects for China to work for the whole world. And this time, China is in a new era, meaning we have very clear-cut guideline for the nation, and we have very clear-cut master plan for the nation for the next 33 years into two steps until 2020. Sorry, yeah, until 2020, we just tried to make it, in Chinese term we call Xiao Kang, a kind of country to leverage the absolute poverty phenomenon. That's within three years time. And within another 30 years, starting from 2020 to 2050, we try to make the nation as a, one of the strongest nations in the world, so far as modernization is concerned. But no matter what we are doing, we just try to take the whole world within our consideration. So proposal of Belt and Road, it is one thing. You cannot say it's the only thing for the future, but that's the very big step for the future. The Belt and Road Initiative empowers less developed countries and enhances regional connectivity, thus facilitating world stability and common prosperity. China's expertise in constructing infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, pipelines, power plants, public telecommunications, and the like, enables global development, exemplifying what President Xi Jinping calls an international community with a shared future for all humanity. That's why China should be sensitive to challenges that Belt and Road faces. One is that China has a hidden agenda or secret motivations, a misguided sense that is inadvertently reinforced when Chinese officials speak only about the benefits to host countries and not about the benefits to China itself. President Xi famously calls for win-win in international affairs. And indeed, mutual benefits are required to assure sustainability. And sustainability of China's Belt and Road Initiative is essential because inequality and poverty remain the world's most severe and intractable problems, which is why all people of goodwill should root for its success. That's Closer to China.